Hi, everyone. My name is Marion Ranchet. So I'm the founder of the Local Light Consultancy uh, and this newsletter called Streaming Made Easy. I'm having a lot of fun with that. And for the last few months, I've decided to take this live a little bit more because I want to have some good conversation with some great people. And so we just finished IBC. Some of us, if not most of us, are still struggling with, you know, the level of stress and fatigue coming out of that event. But we're going to do our best to take you there as if you had spent a few days with us in Amsterdam two weeks ago. Uh, so I'm going to get started and have my panelists uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Thierry. Yes, I'm uh, Thierry Fautier. I figure out I'm the only one uh, out of uh, United States of America. I'm uh, managing director of Your Media Transformation, which is basically helping companies to go beyond what they do. And the tagline is transform or die. Ooh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Provocative. I love it. Uh, Thierry, then Andreas, do you want to give it a go? Yeah, so you call me Andreas, that means I have did I have done something wrong because my mother calls me Andreas, everybody else calls me Andy. So but that's fine. Uh, so. I'm your mom. I'm your mom for the next hour. Behave. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is taking wrong turns, unexpected avenues. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, you said uh, we will bring everybody up to speed, even if they're not there. Does it mean we need to drink now the whole hour? Um, I, I just got water. Maybe we need to get something else. <laughs> no, so, Andy Waltenspiel, I'm running a boutique consultancy, but actually it's increasingly incorrect because what I do is help you to look great. That's not about makeup tips yet. So if anybody wants to extend the value chain I'm covering, please be my guest. No, make you look great and how I talk about you, how I put you in front of the camera. And I'm happy that today it's your job, Marion, no pressure, to make us look great in how you lead that conversation. Awesome. So thanks for the invite. Happy to be here. Welcome. And Keran, last but not least... Uh, thanks, Marion, uh, and thanks for the invitation to join this panel. Um, so I'm Karen Boyd. I am a consultant with, uh, or consulting manager rather, with Coretta Research. Um, we are, well, we consider ourselves to be media tech experts. Um, it is what we do. Um, and I personally, I work with uh, international content distributors and broadcasters to help them procure the right tech for their organization. So awesome. And yeah. previously you were at IBC, so we'll get... Yes, actually, seconds. I should say that I am actually still with IBC. I run um, the Accelerator, or well, I co-lead some of the Accelerator projects um, alongside Mark Smith and Mickey Kulan. So deeply embedded in IBC, although all of the views represented here are my own. Um, okay, good. <laughs> good for the disclaimer. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So uh, I spoke to someone and I said IBC, someone saying, what the hell is this? So International Broadcasting Convention, it's happening every year in beautiful Amsterdam, where I live now. Uh, and uh, this year we had over 45,000 attendees, which is plus two, more or less 2K versus last year. There's over a thousand exhibitors. Uh, and the reason why I want to talk about this event a bit more is, one, I think the content uh, ecosystem doesn't look at this event, you know, uh, they don't look at this event close enough. I think they should. Uh, but I also think that, you know, the technology and the platform side of the business are also not necessarily making it easy for content people to, you know, understand and grasp the opportunity that the event brings, right? So the idea today is to have a bit of a chat about this event, what it stands for uh, in, this, the, in the industry, uh, talk about, you know, the key trends that we've noticed. There's going to be some specific topic. We'll be talking about AI. We'll be talking about white labeling and, you know, making cost savings. I think that's a, a super important topic. We're going to, you know, try to get the pulse also uh, of the industry. Uh, and actually, we're going to start with that, guys. We've spent three, four, five days here um, and, you know, what's your feeling? What's your vibe, you know? kind of top line of, of the events. Uh, it can be from the vendor side, it can be from the buyer side, you know, or even just us, you know, as uh, free agents, let's put it that way. Andres? Yeah. Oh, Lady first. 
Well, I mean, I, you know what I, so this, I think will be my seventh IBC this year. And so I'm kind of, I suppose, newer than a lot of the folks at the event, but for me, this was my favorite one that I've been to thus far. It really feels like this year it was properly back after COVID, um, where the last few years have felt a little bit unshake, uncertain, and we're we're trying to figure out what what's happening in the ecosystem. <clears throat> it seems like now there is a plan and there's some optimism about what's happening. And we kind of all know that hard times are upon us and they're going to continue. And we've seen that in the news over the last few days, but there seems to be at least some direction. Um, whereas last year we were really um, in the middle of the writer's strikes and that was still affecting things. So there was a lot of uncertainty about the market. And I feel like we're moving on. And personally, I had a lot of fun. Um, and that was pr it's probably the funnest IBC I've been to. Um, yeah. So I would say it was generally a pretty, pretty good show. How about you guys? What's your take? So you were IBC seven, I counted was uh, 21 it means I have a bit oh of book right here and Thierry. Bingo. <laughs> Even though, yeah, it, it was one of the bullshit bingo, uh, not bullshit bingo, but just bingo. Yeah, like, uh, uh, how often yeah. have you been here? And uh, oh, I thought you were joining AWS. So, um, 21. I'm sure all of us are joining AWS at some point in our past and future. Yeah, if you want or not, huh? it's like that. <laughs> sucks in everything. But that, that is one of the. Um, one of the problems, right? We see we're in a, in a very mature industry and uh, there is consolidation overdue. Uh, it's not happening at the pace normally you would see on a, let's look at an industry level uh, from the outside. This is how industries evolve. When you are in a mature level, then uh, the number of players will go down and there will be a few that will dominate and AWS is, I think, well positioned. Not saying they are. Uh, Google is another one. Um, but there are some categories of vendors where there's simply too many. And something will have to happen. And well, things happen. We saw announcement during IBC even. So also, and I agree with you, Karen, um, the, the mood is good. It's much better than last year. Last year, it was like, OK, we're on our feet still, but we don't know how long more optimism in the market um so the mood was good yeah yeah you were saying that but when i was on the floor and when i spoke to a couple of vendors it felt like uh they were they were saying that business was harder so i guess at least there's no they're they're not blindfolded right they know something's up right uh they know a change is needed but having said that, a lot were like, okay, if, you know, we get one deal out of this event, then, you know, we'll be happy. That feels mm -hmm. like not so optimistic to, to, to me. So Thierry, I don't know. What's your take? What did you see? Goal, always important to be at both IBC and NAB. I think for all of us who we'll agree, those are the two major events and you can't miss them. Uh, second, I would say, this was, of course, consolidation. I'm not going to hammer that. My previous company tries to sell, could not sell, but maybe others will try to buy later on. So it, it, it's obvious that there are way too many vendors for a shrinking market. But I also believe there will be opportunities for those vendors. And I have my uh, my baton of uh, the pilgrim pilgrim baton of uh, managed service and white label service. If you are in a stagnating industry, if you don't grow your subscriber, why don't you give the key of the house to a company who is going to manage your own service and you are going to stop this stupid RFI, RFP, POC trial, which cost a lot of money. And I think at some time, some CFO will go to the CTO without talking to the, so some CFO will go to the CEO without going to the CTO telling them, hey, I have a great idea. Maybe we can change the way we work. And you might get a similar experience to the end user. And I know Andy is going to catch me and say, yes, that's great. But if you want to be super aggregator, you need this contract with that content provider. You need to put money. Yes, there will still be creativity and dollars and more euros to put on the table. But I believe this industry needs to transform. And all the people who are trying to sell software standalone and convince the customer to buy, I think is this is going to come to an end. 
Yes, there will be partnership of pre-integrated solution, but it's complex to integrate. And I think yeah. we might see some evolution of this market coming forward. Yeah, Terry, a good point saying the CFO will talk to CEO, not even to the to Dilbert, I call him Dilbert, the CTO, right? And uh, you made a point, I think it was yesterday or the day before Marion, where you said uh, a slide with all tech uh, acronyms on the slide and you see too many of that. And I fully agree. If you sell tech, try to sell tech to techies, and the decision is made on a business level, you have a problem. And I see still way too many booths that are full of architecture slides and tech term and not why would anybody need that? Or I can do everything, but it's very unspecific. So selling value to business people is still something that some of the industry have to learn. And if they don't learn fast, they will go under, like transform or die, as Thierry rightfully calls. Yeah, but it's been, yeah, it's been it's been a problem for many years, right? And and I think that it where it's a pressing matter now is that these last few years, like you could expect that you know a lot of new customers will come to you and say, "Oh, I want to have my own, you know, OTT. I want to have my own streaming platforms." Because we're seeing the other side of the business with you know uh, smaller services either closing down or you know consolidation. Uh, again, we'll talk about that a bit later on, but, you know, yep. in the chase for profitability, cost saving, all of those things. I, I mean, if you have a very uh, neat value proposition uh, and yet there's not a lot of net new customers, where are those customers coming from, right? It's kind of the question mark. So are you stealing yep. business from others? Is that what happens? And we all know how difficult it is to migrate from one tech stack to 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 another so it's like where are even for those who manage to have the right value proposition where is the new pocket of of opportunities kind of the question i have but kevin sorry i i don't want to go for it i i think the um i think the sentiment is is not necessarily white labeling or managed service versus build in house because realistically it's a spectrum i think yeah. the i think the ask of the market is for flexibility and this is the word that was screamed from the rooftops for the whole of IBC. And it probably is our biggest buzzword that if we take AI off the table, yeah. flexibility is what people want. Um, well, it's actually, what they want is uh, flexibility translated into not being locked in. Well, so SaaS offers a bit of a different perspective, right? Because if I don't like you, I can just move on. And at some point, because of the niceties in the market, that vendor is expected to help you move on to one of your competitors. Um, so there's more pressure on vendors to deliver. And, you know, speak, speaking frankly, I think about uh, particularly if we're looking at those who don't have uh, a tech team per se, like they might have some infrastructure that they use, they might not have like a media tech specific team. They really don't know what they're asking for. Like they're going to go, here's my list of 700 requirements, bring me something that does exactly what I want. Um, and that fits into my stack and that I can integrate with these 17 different platforms and I needed to do this and I need remote access. I don't want a cloud bill. Don't bring me AWS. And so I think vendors get a little uh, paralyzed with kind of what exactly are we supposed to do with this? Um, and so I think the flexibility element that needs to come from vendors is both the flexibility to be able to work with different products, to work with different profiles of clients, but also to potentially open up new markets to themselves. And we've seen this really well in things like connected cars, like we're seeing all of the, the front end vendors now being able to launch their platforms in BMWs and Mercedes. And that's obviously a new market for them. And I think if you take that flexible mindset to product development, what you end up getting is a product that doesn't just go into a, a tier two telco's backend. You get a product that can go into different kinds of clients, different segments, into different ecosystems, and potentially, hopefully, different verticals. And I think that's where this question of where do the net new clients come from? They're not coming from media and entertainment, sadly. It's going to come from other connected services where we're enabling content consumption. Super interesting. So that's a mouthful. There's my monologue done. Um, I'll see you guys later. No, no, <laughs> but no. But flexibility for me, that's, that's where. I think that on top of flexibility, <laughs> you had efficiency, right? Uh, and also you 
want it to not cost too much? Like, is it is it even possible to actually run, you know, a business where, you know, you tick all of those those boxes. It's flexible, it's efficient, it's not, you know, too expensive. And yet on the other side, you're making enough money. That's, I think that's a bit of the question mark, right? And I, and I think what's interesting with vendors and you see them uh, being challenged by that is they have a lot more of their clients who expect more than the technology from them. Uh, meaning that, you know, uh, so, don't just, you know, build me this thing, help me run it, or in some cases, even further, help me do the strategy. Because at the end of the day, they have this beautiful car, but no one's in it. Uh, no one wins, right? The question is, are vendors actually capable of, you know, advising their clients on things that are beyond tech? Thierry, maybe this one is for you, right? Yeah. Well, I can give you a typical example. Let's talk about my pet subject, which is the codec you still have companies who are showing to operators a brand new codec such as AV1, which requires a, a separate encoding farm, a separate client than the one deployed today, uh, a huge uh, integration into the HDRs and the low latency. And this is great from a vendor point of view, from the operator point of view, it's, uh, excuse my French, freaking nightmare. So the smart one are going to tell you, don't change anything. I'm going to give you a magic bullet, which is the content aware encoding. You can save as many bits as a new codec without changing anything. And then the client say, oh, this is great. I like this idea because I don't need to break anything. I can decrease my traffic. I can reduce my satellite bandwidth. I can go to a, a 4G instead of 5G uh, device. So for me, this is a typical example where the vendors need to stop thinking for themselves, engineering delight, but look at what is the pain point from a financial and operational point of view from the customer side. Yeah, I see Karen um, and uh, Andy saying yes, so I'm going to let you uh, co continue the conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we see a lot of, I mean, my work is literally going into buyer organizations and helping them buy tech, and I'm generally helping them replace something. And the thing we're replacing is not well regarded because they'll go, they promised us this thing and then they weren't able to build it or they promised us this thing and then we bought it and then it sat empty because they didn't onboard us properly or we bought this thing and it actually couldn't do the thing we needed it to do but because we didn't evaluate it properly in the beginning it doesn't work for us or even better we bought this thing the vendor is a nightmare to work with mm. so as much as i completely disagree with your point andy that like it's the technology and the diagrams and the architecture shouldn't be there um, I also completely agree with you that people buy from people. And so yeah. for me, when we're going, how do I evaluate a piece of technology? I would say the two things, because you can't have it all. You can't have the flexibility and the most advanced AI on the, on the market and low storage costs and good integrations across the board. Like you're going to get a bill that you do not want to see, like in an economy that is not supporting that. But if you kind of, you you pick your, the things that are important to you, those two things inevitably should be vendor fit, your work, uh, the vendor fitting into your organization, sorry, fit is a weird word now with TikTok. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know that reference. I'm too old. Oh, yeah. fit means like what I'm wearing. So this ah, is, okay. Yeah. Uh, fit. Yeah. Okay, this is my enough. outfit. I have an influencer sister. This is why, but this is a okay, whole story. Okay. Anyway, but the most important things really that from my perspective that you should be looking are is the cultural fit with the vendor, making sure that you can work with them long term and you like the way that they work because different uh, different organizations have different ways of working, right? Some people have call uh, support centers which are not in the same country as you. How important is that? And then the second thing is, can the product actually do what you need it to do? And that's really where the whole procurement process falls apart because an RFP is just a really long word document that nobody wants to write and nobody wants to read, and you're not really finding anything out about it. Um, so, you know, there's there's a huge balance here to be struck between like what you need um, and what the vendor market yeah. can deliver, and then being able to make those two things work. The problem is procurement. 
uh, I've been in a procurement role uh, a long time ago. I said, so if I get paid, if my bonus is due to I bring down price from this year to next year by 10%, that's all I will do. So get what you pay for. Um, but then let me see if this works. So uh, this is my favorite picture. Um, not sure we can do it full screen. There's always someone going to be doing it cheaper. Uh, but if you want that nice Pegasus, but you get what this guy is getting uh, tattooed on his back, yeah, it can always be cheaper. So um, get what you pay for and yeah, I think total cost of ownership and, um, but it's difficult to find the vendor fit if you just, if the key criteria is price. And yeah, so uh, Kieran, about how buyer uh, go at it, right? Is there a trend in the way that they're buying? Are they looking at buying this, you know, thing that is doing everything and then they don't really care about what's happening in the background or are they more uh, in a setup where they do piecemeal, meaning that, you know, they will do that work of assembling the best of tech and make that work. I assume this varies depending on the size of the company to your point, yeah. do they have a team, yes or no? Yeah, what are you seeing there? You know, I think it it really depends. I think, you know, the uh, and Terry can speak to this far more than I can. The telco market is doing its own thing, um, which is very big on outsourcing as much as possible, um, where they'll have like a TV product manager that might manage that internally, but generally they're not like a tech person. Um, the the trend that we're really seeing at the moment is in um, say like more content studio type setups or distribution houses. We're seeing a very big trend there about trying to go, okay, we want this ma'am and we want this broadcast management system and we want this right system coming in. And we bring it all together. It's a fantastic setup, especially if you can get it to work with your storage and infrastructure. But then the issue you're faced and the, the where the market is uh, still developing is who's going to come and make them all speak to each other mm -hmm. because that's what that's what we want right um, and again so there's an opportunity in the market there particularly if we're thinking around people who are able, able to offer managed services to also come in and do those integrations because this has the opportunity to transform these organizations like you're able to leverage your catalog more you're able to launch fast channels with um, very low effort, um, but with a lot of data to support that it may be successful. Um, you're able to start looking at new ad tech and dynamic ad insertion. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities in doing this. It's just whether or not you're at the stage where you're willing to dive in because it's a huge investment. It's a, it's a huge um, transformation for an organization. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's there's a lot of change out there, but primarily I think it's in those people with rich content libraries because those are those are the people who are going to win right now because they don't have to license from people; they've got it in house. I see. So Marion, I have a, I have a comment to make since both you and I were at the Devon Croft conference prior to IBC, and if you recall, the orchestration was a big thing. Who is going to orchestrate all those complicated workflows? And of course, if you go to AWS, they tell you, we have it all figured out for you. All the building blocks exist already. Pick this vendor is going to work. That's one thing. If you look more on the distribution side company, you know, like the, the, the transcoding origin server, they bring you a completely pre-integrated solution within their SaaS offering, which means what you used to piecemeal before, you get it from one single vendor. And I think simplicity, Karen, is for me the name of the game because the team do not have all the muscles and the time and the money to build custom solution. And they probably have to build Legos based, super Legos based on Legos that are already pre-integrated. So for me, it's a theme that was confirmed at IBC that uh, operators don't have the patience to rebuild the whole system. Or the knowledge, really. And I mean, knowledge. just... But the other piece of this, which is the, the the dark horse and the thing that can potentially sandbag these pro projects, is that you might get a pre-integrated solution, and that's wonderful. And they may it may come to you, and you'll choose a vendor based on the fact that they have certain pre-integrations that work with what you've already got. The issue comes in the implementation when you go, hmm, 
the data that I got out of this system is in no way fit for purpose to go into the new one because we never bothered with figuring this system out. We just started dumping files into one place and now we've got a mess and you have to do that data transformation piece. Um, and then, you know, you've also then got oh, AI, can this help us? Um, and then so, although the solution is definitely, um, it might be in the market and the vendors can help you out. There's this other bit about how do we actually get the system working, which is, I think, another part of the market that we have to figure out. Because, I mean, when you go, oh, okay, cool, we're going to get a new MAM. And then you see the files that came that are ready to go in and they are disorganized. And like, it's things like renaming files and a consistent naming convention to be able to find things. Um, and this is man hours and a lot of them, because, I mean, you're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of catalog items with, you know, sub catalogs and all sorts of things. So it's it's a very complex problem. Karen, you mentioned <laughs> AI. And I think that's the perfect segue because, uh, of course, that was the buzzword. We had a few. I was super disappointed. Benedict Evans was supposed to keynote. He didn't come. So it, I think it would have been the highlight. I, I really love this guy. I think he's fascinating. It was the buzzword, although all 14 were Microsoft uh, at its booth and we were supposed to have tons of, it felt empty and awkward. Uh, I also felt, again, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a techie, but you had that word being thrown in on everyone else's booth. And then you're thinking, is that truly, you know, AI or is it just there because you know that's what that's what people want, right? And that's appealing to 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 sellers. So, like anything that you know uh, caught your attention on the on the topic of AI, that can be a demo, uh, that can be the lack of innovation, that can be market feedback. I have a few things from content people on on that topic, but yeah, go for it. So AI everywhere, I'm, I had a panel and uh, EJ, the CEO of Norwegian Media, uh, did a very cool speech. No slides. I said he, he doesn't have slides, but he has a tie. Yeah. Hi, and, a and a magnificent haircut. Like I'm Absolutely. Super and he's a great speaker. Uh, okay. So if you, if you have the chance, go, go see him. And he doesn't okay. pay me for saying that. Uh, I, tr I truly liked it. And he said, you know, uh, we, don't talk about, we don't talk about the internet. It's mm -hmm. there. We use it. We don't talk about electricity. It powers our devices. We don't talk about it. Same for software. AI is the same. It will be there. It will be everywhere. We have, call it algorithm, call it machine learning, call it AI. I mean, the buzzword is AI, but it's not a hype like uh, 3D or the metaverse that will likely go away. It's here to stay. And everybody will use it and we will talk less about it. We'll talk about the use cases. So we're back to, let's talk about what is in it for us. What problems is it solving and how much does it cost? Because not everything that's doable does make sense from a financial standpoint. So I, I would like to make one comment based on the real story. I cannot name the customer, but uh, I met him at uh, NAB and he was telling me, I told him, what are you doing here? He said, I'm going to search for subtitling company that can translate uh, my speech, his French, to text. And I said, but what? This is available from Google. What are you talking about? And he told me, no. First, it doesn't work for French. Second, it's studio capture content. I have reporters with a lot of noise that give me a lot of challenges. And third, they don't have the requirement of the regulator that requires you to not miss a single word in the speech. And then you see the demo at Hall 14, great, wonderful, and you wonder how can this fit into a professional, carrier-grade, regulated environment, and then you realize this might take many years to come to fruition. So what I said last year is still valid this year. Uh, watch what you are looking for, because yes, it might work on the trade show, but if you want to deploy in a commercial environment, it might not be good enough. And therefore you might need to work more, probably with the same vendor, but giving more clear requirements, more test files, which are your files, not his files. And of course, convince the regulator that 
maybe it is not possible to do it automated way, maybe only for the web channel, not for the terrestrial channel. So I think people start to realize now that what they see might not fit their needs. That's yeah, my actually, comment. How can you check, right? So talking about localization, like a lot of, uh, so I, I don't see a lot of true content people at, at IBC, right? I From the distribution or the acquisition side, it does happen. Now, and I would say it's thanks to FAST because uh, FAST is closer uh, to anything they've done before. Huh? It's uh, closer to their traditional business of acquiring and licensing content. So they actually are more interested and they are the ones having those conversations with the, the FAST vendors. Uh, and so very logically, they've done that first step these last few years. And now it's a matter of, you know, how do I grow, you know, outside of English speaking markets, right? And so to your point, folks are searching for uh, AIs to do subtitling, but more importantly, dubbing, right? Because subtitling, I believe is cheaper, except it's considered not good enough in certain markets. If you look at the French market, the German market, uh, we 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 want dubs, or the market wants dub, or the market thinks they want dubs. It's too expensive for you know this new economy of streaming, let alone fast. And so people are looking to to AI to fix that, but then they end up having you know a French file and a German file and. How can they even check that it is, you know, good enough, right? I mean, they're at a point where even if they give it a go with a couple of, you know, titles, their own titles, uh, I, I receive files from companies saying, okay, what do you think, you know, as a French, is it good enough? Is that the way they should do business? Is there a way, Keran, to, to manage that, right? Because otherwise, I think the adoption from these companies, uh, it's, it's going to take time, right? Yeah, AI is a really is is an interesting subject for many reasons, but I think the the two sides of it for me are um if your error rate is lower than what your human error rate is, why wouldn't you use it? But how do you um, measure? That's uh, you send it to Marion. Well, you have to, you know, because look, so mm -hmm. I think buyers should be experimenting as much as they can with AI, Indeed. but within the, within the context of knowing that in five years time, what we're talking about now is going to seem so silly and basic. So I, you know, like it, it kind of irritates me when I see vendors who have like AI module, which is like an additional add on to their pro product. Cause I'm just like, your existing product uses AI. You're just marketing this as like a, as an upsell, really. And maybe there's some extra work that needs to go into that. I'm sure that there is. But at the same time, this should be your value proposition. You should be giving it to your customers to use it, to play with it, to try and break it, to train it. Like I don't, I don't understand kind of the the um the gatekeeping on this technology. You should be developing it with your your customers because. Vendors don't have huge ca content catalogs that they can test like their localization algorithm on, but your client does. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a balance, right? Like maybe don't invest too much, but play with it. Like see what you can get your hands on and absolutely speak to your partners because they have something in the works, whether they're telling you about it or not. Um, yeah. And I don't think that there should be a fear around it like if we use it responsibly most companies will go get a policy in place before they start playing you know have fun it's it's tech it's cool like it's cool it is you wanted to chime in yes so for me there is a very simple use case of ai i am a content provider and i have only made english audio plus English subtitle, and maybe for three or four major countries, I have the subtitling. I want to go to India, and as you know, in India, not everybody speaks English. So you have to not dub it, but uh, let's put it subtitling in the four or five different languages. You can reach 1.5 billion people, even if it's not perfect, the guy will still enjoy to see in his own language, the subtitling that would never come because it's a long tail content from the content provider. So I think AI is going to unlock some market and also some mindset of content provider who say, oh, I cannot distribute this content in this country. Wrong, you can, 
And if the consumer says it's not good, then you'll get negative review at worst, but still yeah. people will be able to use it. I think mm -hmm. but the, the, the thing is that I think the, the, the standard is broadcast quality, right? This is oh, what so they're trying to achieve. And clearly it's not attainable at the stage AI is, right? So content right. providers told me AI dubbing, you know, not there yet. Uh, yeah. not at scale and not in all languages and not in all types of setup meeting, meaning some were saying for documentaries, it works, but whenever, you know, we're talking scripted and you have me, you know, uh, speaking, like that, it doesn't work. I've actually, um, I've actually heard someone said that, and I need to get my hands on the, on the data source on that, but about your point about they're going to be happy. Users are going to be happy because it's in their language, etc. Uh, when it comes to AI dubbing and not subtitling, uh, apparently the threshold uh, for users to, you know, watch and listen to an AI doing dubbing is like 10 minutes before they get tired of it. So that's fascinating. I do think that it's kind of a hit or miss. Maybe sub subtitling, you know, we get, it can make do, there's a typo, you know, you move on, etc. cetera. But uh, the fact that you are listening to, uh, you know, a computer generated, you know, voice, if it's not perfect, you have that mm -hmm. risk of losing the viewer and it's a bit hit or miss. And we're at a time where people want uh, viewers to spend as much time as possible with their content. So that's where I think Kieran is right. Folks are experimenting, but it's yeah. very difficult to put it out there because you're really giving the end product to the viewer. And yeah, if it's not good enough, that it's not good enough and you've kind of lost your chance. And at a moment where there's so much content, so folks were saying, Mr. Beast sounds great in Spanish. So it, is there this thing where, you know, if it's on YouTube or if it's on broadcast TV or in streaming, then, you know, uh, maybe the, 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 it's not as relevant and it's not as problematic if it's not just perfect. But when you pay the license fee or when you pay 20 bucks to Netflix a month, you want the top quality, right? This is what it's you've been doing. It's a spectrum, isn't it? Because you'll have, I mean, you know, we're we're all consultants. Um, so when somebody comes to you with something that you can do quickly, you price it lower. When it takes more time, it costs more. And I think, you know, if you have a, if you have a, if you're like an, an all three media or a BBC studios and you have a lot of documentary content, like, and that can reliably be dubbed, then you know your dubbing bill goes down regardless of whether or not you can do it with your whole library. Yeah. So it just you know I think as as we catch up or as AI catches up to what yeah. we needed to do, then we'll start using it more. Um, you know, uh, just an example of something which honestly this is not like a this is not like a oh my god look what AI can do like this is such a small thing. But there is uh, we saw a company and I wish I could remember. Oh, uh, they're called um, iMovo, I think. Um, I'll get the name. But what they do, it's a layer that sits on top of your storage and it goes through all of your files and it goes and find it tags, it creates metadata out of that and it can do so reliably. It can give you really good quality metadata. And I mean, even just having that layer on top then goes, oh shit, I forgot we have that series that has yeah. da, 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 da. or it helps your salespeople be able to go, oh. Uh, I need something about penguins. Let me type into the map. Okay, penguins. Here we go. It, Here's our cat. Yeah, but it's in the background, right? So this is where I think AI could focus so right not, now. It's not what's like blowing anyone's minds, yeah. but it is so useful to the people who have who need it yeah. that oh, it's oh, like one of those, you know, as as you both said, Andy. A hundred percent. Like on scheduling, for example, whether you're talking fast or else, uh, I think, you know, this is what the market wants, right? Making sure that at least that first level of programming can be done, you know, thanks to AI or whatever, uh, to then let people actually put, you know, man hours into what makes a difference, which is the curation, not losing time searching for pieces of content here and there to, to build a schedule. So uh, super on board with that, uh, with that use case. Andreas, yeah. you want to say something? Uh, you see Andreas again, okay. Um, yeah, sorry. That's, that's it. fine. That's my name. Um, so I'm running a study these days with tier one operators and AI, of course, is a big topic. Uh, a lot of experimentation still. 
Uh, many started in let's do the cool use cases and quickly took the turn to let's see what can save us cost. Mm -hmm. And one of the question is how do you measure success of uh, whatever you do in AI and a variety of answers. Okay, we measure NPS, we measure costs, we measure time to market. And some said, as long as the user experience is not badly impacted, it's good enough. Or if it works, it's good enough. Yeah. But the cost of running AI 24-7, and that's to your point, do I need AI to do all my metadata 24-7? That can become very costly. Mm -hmm. And I might not have the return on investment of doing that. So, yeah, it's the actual intelligence is also still quite quite in fashion and not just blindly like in the, in the beginning everybody yeah let's go to cloud the cloud is great and then they realized oh the bills of ingress and egress uh, will be huge uh, we'll have the same with ai oh we, we were having yeah. it right now it's a shift in the market towards software though right like so when you are using more software you are you have more data available to you so you know, and th this is one of the reasons why um, ad supported TV, I just heard the other day we're saying past now for paid ad supported TV. Um, so, you know, whatever we're calling that in the future, whatever it will become, you know, one of the very powerful things about it is I know how viewers are reacting to my content, but actually, you know, um, and so the opportunity is we have all of this data. And so you have to use it like AI isn't just a let me bolt a module onto a system and then it's going to do this thing for me. AI is going to be our way of working. Like we're, all of our jobs are going to change. Like, and this is yeah. why this, uh, being kind of hesitant about the implementation is a bit weird. Cause it's like, this is coming, get on board. Like it's cool. It's going to help you. But, um, you know, so you have to kind of, I think, evaluate all of those things with the available data that you have and content performance, ROI, TCOs, time to, mar time to market is kind of one thing I think in the early stage of, of, AI, it may be a less relevant question because we don't know what it's how easy it's to implement these things. But yeah, it's it's not a like a. It, this is you know these are big business decisions that that people need to make with with data and hopefully these these companies have lots of clever business analysts who can tell them whether or not they should be going for it. Because otherwise, they can always call you, right? Us. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, not me. The very clever people who do that with incorrect research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just buy the tech. <laughs> uh, guys, one one question about uh, skills, yes. right? Because yeah. uh, AI, along with everything else, um, so it was interesting. We had uh, RTS, which is the Royal, uh, you know, Television Society, so uh, an organization in the UK. They they did a fireside chat. Uh, with Evan uh, Shapiro, but the, the, the point was really to uh, present uh, a mini MBA that they, they had in the works. So I think, again, huh, to train the next media and entertainment or the next broadcast uh, executive of, uh, of, uh, of the coming years. Uh, what have you seen, you know, uh, around the show floor or in the discussion about that topic of, you know, upskilling folks, right? Whether that's AI or other topic. And I think, Kiran, that takes us to diversity, to talk about diversity. Yeah. Um, look, it, the skills issues, it's not new, right? The, the market has, has been struggling with this for a really long time. Um, and if you look around... I can't speak for the US, but certainly if you look around Europe, you're not going to see many programs which train broadcast engineers or, or media people and specifically the business that we work in. Pretty sure none of us have a degree in what we're doing right now. So, you know, like I, I was trained as a lawyer. So, yeah, yeah there you go. Um, so I think it's it's absolutely necessary that we need to have more training, but it's also like we need to support the development of those people within our organizations because it's changing quite quickly and it's really easy to just go. And I hear this so much and I don't know why poor, the poor broadcast engineers get it, but everyone's like, oh, broadcast engineers, they don't want to learn new systems. And I'm just like, well, you know, we're, we can't just be turping people out of our company. It's like, let's think about it. And the beautiful thing about these software defined workflows is that many of them are low or no code. So when we're talking about like needing to reskill, you're not really teaching somebody that's, you're not teaching them to like code all of a sudden, you're just teaching them to learn a new system. And yeah. that then brings the, the question in of, we need to be better at change management. Honestly, that's oh, yeah. literally what it is which is making sure, and that's the way that we Coretta propose you buy um, tech, which is 
put it back into the hands of your stakeholders. If they can use it, you know you've got a system which will work for you. Yeah, but like I said, we need to transform. We need to change. Uh, a great example from uh, Formula One. Yeah, so you think there is a race, and who wins the race? It's not the driver. The strategy decisions are taken not at the racetrack, somewhere in the factory in Milton Keynes, and there's a data scientist, a woman, by the way, and she calls the shots on a, on a Red Bull race. She tells Verstappen what to do, when to go into the pit stop. Um, the other cool job that uh, we should have learned or we're in the process of doing is prompt engineering. Yeah, so it's the, it's the age of the prompt. If you don't know how to do good prompts, AI will do giggle, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. uh, you will not get what you want. Uh, so training people, but also training your system. And that was one of the challenges I hear. What's so difficult with AI? Where do I get good training data? So I need to train my team to use the system, but first I need to train the system itself. So, yeah, we need to be hiring more data scientists. That's that's what absolutely. Jim, Jerry, you don't need uh, to raise your hands. <laughs> no, because I see there's a lot of back and forth discussion. So I just want to say I have something interesting to say. No, for, for me, if I take the example of the. The Olympics, it was quite striking to see the OBS people who come with a very well thought architecture, software based, everything running on data center that they bring at the venue. And in the same panel, you had the poor guy for BE, from B in sport who say, I have my existing boxes that I need to reuse. I don't have ST2110 because I cannot change my infrastructure just for the spike of the Olympics. And here it shows you that, yes, if you have all the environment and the money and the time to train for the next even two to, two to four years, yes, you can do miracles. If you are tied by existing budget, existing skills, existing uh, equipment that you cannot replace, then this is not going to happen. And I think for me, this was a very eye-opening to see on the same job, you can do it in a very different way, depending on where you come from and where you want to go to. So guys, there's a Q&A here. Uh, so feel, feel free to send some, some questions. I haven't seen any. Uh, so in the meantime, I'll ask something uh, to, to, to you guys. Uh, let me know if you want to take this one, but on sustainability, right? So uh, where are we uh, on on that front? Was it you know uh, a talk of the show floor, or was it just a nice to have? Where do we stand on that? So maybe I can start with my one hour brainwashing at the greening of streaming uh, members meeting, although I, I I was flagged as a sleeping part of the time. But for me, it was the confirmation of the back and forth discussion we had with Dom Robinson and his team where I was thinking as an engineer that the less bits I put on the network, the less network, the less energy in the network is going to consume. And this is damn wrong because the network is based on capacity and it runs all the time. Nobody stops to transmit bits because there's no bit to transmit. So at the end of the day, it's very uh, tough to optimize the network. You can do a lot of things on a device, obviously, but on the network is very tough. And my conclusion is, yes, we can do miracles if we could switch on and off the network. For example, some people in the mobile network right now are switching off some base stations which are unused from midnight to 5 a.m. That's mm -hmm. possible. In that case, you are going to drastically reduce on a certain part of the day. But I think the challenge for our industry is to have software-defined networks where you will be eventually able to say, okay, less capacity, I'm going to pull, pull down the, the capacity, the, uh, less traffic, therefore I can pull down the capacity on demand. And this doesn't exist yet. So I think we still have a long way to go. For me, the striking news is that we now have data to argue before we had opinions. And therefore, we, we are probably on the right track and I will let uh, my colleagues uh, oh, to... Uh, continue the conversation. Yeah, um, we only have one planet and 
we still think, okay, if it's more costly, then uh, no, let's not do it. Yeah, that's that's unfortunately many I hear is exactly that. Said so yes, a few exceptions. Uh, great said we can differentiate by circular economy. Super cool. Now, often the consumers who need to buy that uh, said, I'm not going to pay five euros more because this set the box is more green. Uh? And if the offer over there, I get the same content, just, yeah, this, this TV has less power consumption. Unless I pay for it, um, I don't care. So there's a lot of stuff happening on a corporate level and ESG rules and yes, of course, and I optimize my data center, but it's not used when they talk to the customer. Yeah, so very, very seldom yeah, there's, there's no, it needs to have a business case in order to become something. And in your opinion, it's not there yet. It's not there yet with exceptions, but it's not there yet. It's, it's not a problem of the vendors. They have great ideas, really ambitious. It's just the, the operator side, the buyer side is not buying because their customers couldn't care less. In still a tough environment economically, uh, cost of living crisis, less money in the purse. So, uh, yeah, I want my soccer, but or I want my MTV, as Dire Straits sang back then. Um, there's not enough money there to pay for it, and that's not good. So actually, there's a, someone. There's a great question uh, in uh, in the chat. Uh, we spoke about AI. We how one should invest. We're talking about sustainability, <laughs> and someone's saying, is it possible to drive you know sustainability and embrace AI given the resources and energy it takes to train LLMs? Good. I, it's a good. Yeah. Uh, good. Yeah. Look, I think. The, the thing I think that is encouraging in the market at the moment is, as Andrea said, the vendors have a lot of good ideas. And I think that the place that we need to get to is that it's something that consumers want. It's uh, something which is not going to come with an insane cost. So an example that someone gave me a couple of years ago, well, actually it was last year, uh, they were saying that they didn't get... Um, they didn't get some rating on the Albert production scale because they had, I can't remember if it's LEDs or the bad light bulbs, but they had the bad light bulbs in their facility. And it would have cost them something like 150,000 pounds to replace all of the light bulbs in their facilities. But if they had done that, the saving would have been something like double over the, the, the lifetime, let's say of the light bulb um, because of how much power they would save. But his, his point was, so do I take perfectly functioning light bulbs and just throw away all of these light bulbs just because I'll get a better Albert certification and therefore I will be greener? Or do I do the logical thing, which is wait till the end of their life and then replace them once they're done? Mm -hmm. So, and I think that it's, there's a lot of conundrums like this around sustainability. And the answer frankly is like, we don't really know. Like we know, for, we know for a fact that the, and this is from the EcoFlow project that uh, we just did with IBC accelerators. We know for a fact that the end user device is the biggest power con consuming part of the supply chain. And, but like something overwhelming, like it's an overwhelming amount that it, that it consumes power. So when we're going like, okay, cool, but we'll like reduce the capacity and the diet design and da, 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 da. I mean, you're really talking about like very small adjustments on that supply chain relative to something like the device. So it's kind of going like, what can we do? Where are the easy wins and where do we need to, to do better? Um, and unfortunately that device side of it is, is a very big thing, but does that mean people are gonna stop watching very high definition content or that 8K is gonna go away and people aren't gonna then go, oh, I want 16K content. Like, of course they are, they want bigger TVs. Like, you know, they want all these things. So it's a very, very complicated question. Um, and whether or not AI will be part of the solution or the problem, I don't know. I think the solution, because you'll be able to um, manage your power consumption better if you're doing it in an intelligent way, right? You can turn things off. And in the streaming workflow, turning things off is probably the best way of saving power. So, you know, yeah, it's- one, one use case I saw um company, Big Telco said that we're using AI to predict your usage pattern. So you don't switch off your box. So we switch it off because uh, normally after th mm -hmm. there's no interaction on the box after 11 p.m. So we switch it off. Yeah. Uh, 
and, uh, and you know what? Yeah. Yeah. Much power. And I mean, I another you know, great thing I saw was an audio only mode. Um, Acido had a platform, and this was part of the demo for EcoFlow, where you can click audio only mode, and then your display goes off. And if yeah. the device is the is the biggest power consuming factor in your supply chain, just turning that device uh, screen off. Again, huge savings. Um, so it's kind of thinking like, what can we do with customers that will make them have better habits around consumption and, and power consumption and content consumption? Um, but you know, what is going to make sense for them? Not just because we're going green, green, green. Because as Andrea said, like we want people to care more than they do. Yep. 100%. So guys, we're coming uh, at the end of our uh, session. Went too, too, too fast. Uh, so. Is there one thing uh, that you saw a demo, an innovation? If there's none, then that says a lot about the state of uh, the industry. But uh, so think hard, uh, and also if you have time, you know, uh, look ahead to 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 next year. But very briefly, we got two minutes left, so I'll let you know any one of you. Andy, do you want to start? Yeah. There we go. Yes, 70% CDN capacity saving during Olympics, big French operator. How? Put the CDN into the boxes, distribute it peer-to-peer -peer like, but without the bad commutation. So it was a big uh, operator who owns content, loved it. So you love peaks, you love the audience because the more people share, the better. Saving cost, big thing. The other side, monetization. Uh, nobody likes ad load. So what if you can do $1 per household per month with just two ads per day? Starhub in, uh, in Singapore is doing that. Very cool stuff. You see an ad when you click the button on your remote. You exit Netflix. Then I call Amazon. Okay, I got 1.5 million exit on Netflix on the day. Just you go to for a tenth of a second to the UI. Then I get a Netflix, uh, the Amazon ad. Different CPM and guaranteed view. Clever things like that, I think, will, will change quite a lot. Nice. Thierry? Well, I will do some advertisement. A company I've been working with for some time, uh, Visual On was showing on the mobile device, content aware encoding implemented in the telephone, meaning that when you shoot your video, you store half of the content on your phone. So think of people going to the cloud because it's uh, not sitting on their phone or people who buy a phone like myself that cannot be hardware upgraded because the, there's no SIM card. So there's no slot for SSD, external SSD. So I think what I like is the fact that the professional technology are now coming to consumer. And the other one I would say is the Amlogic demonstration of ZT set-top box doing automatic translation of subtitle in the language you pick. Oh, nice. I, I want to get my hands uh, on that demo. Let's uh, let's chat. Keran. What do you have? How are both of those? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let's uh, let's do a second session. Let's uh, check it out. Yeah. Well, please show and tell. Um, so I'm gonna go slight, slightly boring on this. Uh, I think some of the coolest stuff that I saw at IVC was around 5G, and I'm very excited about what happened during the summer sports season over the Olympics and Wimbledon, and just the way that uh, everybody is now using 5G. I think the private networks are really coming along, and we're gonna see a lot of product progress there so i'm very excited to have less cables and it's more sustainable <laughs> awesome. Marion, and you me what did you I see to say, yeah, first. yeah 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 well I'll, I'll have to be honest with you i had no time to check out anything on any uh of uh of uh of the booth uh what i will say is i'm fascinated by how the event has been changing from purely tech to tech platform and, and content. I still think that it's not catering enough to content people. And at the end of the day, those are the people you sell to. So I think we need to find a way to, to do a better job at that. Uh, that would be my, uh, my main takeaway and my wish for next year. So I'll see you guys next year because I'll be there. It's just a bike ride for me. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you for everyone who attended. And uh, yeah, have a lovely day. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Marion, for having us. Bye, everyone.